So let me start out, I want to ask the people in the crowd here, uh, first of all, how many of you have children? How many people in the crowd have children? Okay. How many of you would place your child on an airplane flying from San Francisco to Tokyo with no pilot on board, <laughs> with no drone pilot watching the controls, completely navigated by AI in the cockpit? How many would put their children on that plane? Don't answer it if you don't love your kids. <laughs> so okay, that's so good. So with that in mind, Aaron, um, I want to get, I, I asked that question because I want to get this question out of the way first. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Turing uh, is one of the fathers of modern computing. He, along with Claude Shannon, really sort of pioneered uh, the philosophy and technology behind modern computing. He also was the guy that cracked the Enigma code during World War II that was instrumental to ending the war in the North Pacific when U-boats were sinking several ships a day uh, uh, from the Allies. And Turing once said in, in 1950 that uh, by the end of this decade, we'll speak of machines thinking without being contradicted. So there's two ways to take that quote. The first is that he meant when we speak of machines thinking, nobody will disagree with us. But what I think he really meant was, when machines think, they will not expect humans to contradict them. Yeah. Right? So I understand that Phillips recently did a study that showed that artificial intelligence is better than radiologists in, in diagnosing tuberculosis on screening x-rays. So with that in mind, how soon before artificial intelligence replaces the average radiologist? Yeah, Roy, so I think it, looking at that study, and you actually see a plethora of these kinds of studies coming up, is no surprise, because if you look at what the machine really does, it's just recognizing a pattern. So if you look at that very narrow form of artificial intelligence that has no real reasoning but detects a pattern, it's very likely that the computer doesn't have any fatigue, is looking for the signal consistently, it will be better than a human. But I think it's also, at the same time, a very narrow view of what a radiologist actually does. Because it's the reasoning of what does that pattern actually mean to an individual, to that patient, and also taking a lot of human aspects into considerations, like this is an elderly patient with no support system, is already having multiple illnesses, and now you see early on stage of some cancer, but he's already 97 years old. You will not take the same path as if you would find a pediatric patient with that finding. So I don't see radiologists going away anytime soon. I think if anything, they will be able to devote more time to really focus on the care for the patient and on what matters and leverage and harness the benefits of these narrow types of applications that can streamline and automate a lot of things. Yeah, I, I, uh, I would fully agree. I, I wouldn't put my child on that airplane either. And, um, and I also believe that I actually, uh, I tell medical students when I still have the chance to talk to them that artificial intelligence is going to make medicine more humane. It's going to re remove the uh, sort of mundane tasks that humans don't need to do, make them more efficient, speed them up, and then as a result, there'll be potentially more time to focus on, on the human being in front of you. Um, so despite that pragmatic answer, um, artificial intelligence is still being overhyped, I believe. I was a gene therapy researcher in the late uh, 80s and 90s back when I was a postdoc, and we used to cringe when the New York Times would publish an article saying that you know, multiple genetic diseases would be cured by the year 2000 with gene therapy. We thought it was 30 or 40 years old, and if, if you know what the natural history of gene therapy's been, there's only been one therapeutic that's made it to market. It got pulled off last year because it was a million dollars a dose. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's still people working diligently in the field and there's no doubt that it's going to bear fruit at some point. But uh, is it, are we in a situation where artificial intelligence is perhaps being overhyped in a similar way? I, I think to, to a large extent it is. And uh, you have to understand that where AI really excels is in simple, very narrow, narrowly defined problems, which you can, you can distill to a mapping problem of taking an input and mapping it to a set of categories. That's most of what artificial intelligence does today. Um, be it language translation or pattern recognition or classification, that's at the end of the day what the algorithm does. Um, at the same time, I think the technology is tremendously valuable in lots of other ways not only in the image interpretation, which gets a lot of attention these days, 
But in a lot of other ways, you could apply artificial intelligence to streamline workflows and also handle things upstream of even all the way before the image is acquired yeah. and all the way downstream to the way the results and decision making takes place. It's, it's like thinking of the self-driving cars, which at some point will get there. But along the way, we can also use artificial intelligence to just enhance the driving experience and save time in traffic and do all these other great things that we can do uh, while we get there, perhaps at some point. Got it. So let me ask you a series of, um, let me make a series of statements about uh, artificial intelligence use in healthcare in the moment. And you either say true or false uh, and they explain why. So the first statement is, Artificial intelligence is routinely being used presently to predict the onset of disease in large populations of patients. So I, I don't think we're there uh, nowadays at all. And I think- That's a false fact, then. That's a false. Okay. Um, I think there's even a risk at this point in time that the machines are finding patterns and that's a correlation. It doesn't mean there's a causal relationship between the patterns that's recognized as a signal and the actual clinical uh, condition or outcome. So I think, while the tools could be greatly helpful at finding patterns we might miss otherwise, we need to pay uh, a lot of attention to really see that those correlations are really true. Got it. That makes sense. Got it. Okay, here's statement number two. Artificial intelligence is routinely being used to provide definitive diagnoses to clinicians evaluating patients. So I would say that's a false too. Uh, I think, uh, as, as we mentioned, there are lots of narrow specific tools that are starting to pop up. I think they still have a long way to see not just that the algorithms are correct and how to properly validate those algorithms, but also to find the right way to weave them into the workflow, which is the other aspect. And you then encounter, I've had interesting conversations here, in fact, about all sorts of behavioral aspects you also need to uh, take care of, such as what happens when people become overly reliant on an algorithm that performed well for a while, but might not always perform correctly. So there are behavioral aspects on the adoption of the technology we really need to take into account sure. beyond just the algorithm itself. Okay, here's the last statement. Artificial intelligence is routinely being used to improve the efficiency of clinicians performing tasks. So I would say that's an almost. It's, uh, we have the technology today and we, we are showing solutions that are available today that do exactly that. I wouldn't say routinely because not everyone has it just yet. But I think uh, that's where uh, we've been focusing on how to apply artificial intelligence to streamline workflows, automate the mundane tasks, and make life easier for the physician. Got it, yeah, very good. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's, let's leave uh, pragmatism behind for a moment. Let's leave big data uh, behind. Let's leave machine learning behind for a moment. Let's talk about uh, neural networks and deep learning. So wh what do you think the future holds for uh, the evaluation of the shapes and contours and shades on images, uh, combining with other clinical and genomic data, you know, in ways uh, in which the human eye can't see patterns and the mind can't anticipate them. It strikes me that in some ways, we're really skimming the surface now when we're sitting in dark rooms looking at you know, shiny screens and relying on the individual experience and competence of the clinician, which is not to be obviously uh, scoffed at, but it, nothing compared to having that, that information from billions of individuals uh, consolidated into one sort of learning platform. So what's the future for radiology images? I mean, it, it strikes me that it's really going to be the you know, that ridiculously uh, overused statement that a picture is going to be worth more than a thousand words. Is that true? So I think we are starting to see some really interesting research done in this field and the potential is to detect patterns that you might not detect otherwise. We only know to look for certain things because we know we should be looking for them. What artificial intelligence offers in particular deep learning is to find signals that we might not think of and especially as you consider complex MR scans that have so many parameters looking at the tissue, combining all of that information, reducing that multi-dimensional space to find the signals that could tell things apart, I think is a hugely promising aspect of deep learning. At the same time, we need to caution and see that those correlations are really true, but we're already starting to hear about research where the computer was able to correctly discern, based on historical data, 
different classes of patients, a benign versus a malignant uh, uh, finding. And even after the fact, when you show it to clinicians, they can't tell them apart or explain why this one is benign and that one is malignant. So certainly, we're skimming the surface there and the patterns will emerge uh, from other places too. Got it, and I, I think similar things are happening in, in uh, clinical pathology as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's a similar exercise, right? It's, it's seeing patterns and images and then using other data to correlate with those patterns that in one individual human mind can't perhaps, uh, can't perhaps calculate, so. But also one last question, so, so I'm going to assume that you believe that it's true that the ultimate power of artificial intelligence will only be wrought when we are able to pool and combine the data from not just 100 patients or 10,000 patients, but from billions of patients around the world. This is something I like to think about. I call it the perpetual global clinical trial of the future. So if that's true, we don't really talk much about the storage of that data, where it goes, or how we move it around over networks. Uh, aren't those technical challenges we still have to deal with before we can realize that potential? So I think the storage in the networks is actually the easy part. Uh, the much more challenging part is that in healthcare, much of the data is unstructured by nature. A pixel is only worth as much as what actually happened, what the clinical facts about the patient are, and that's not stored in the pixel. So you really need to think through the data architecture and the data representation of all of that clinical information that today is sometimes buried in a simple textual note that mentions that this patient also has a family history of this and that or underwent a certain procedure or therapy, and that's buried right now. So we first need to find a way to bring all of that information to the surface in such a way that you can apply the big data analytics and the, the deep learning on top of that. And I think that is going to be a frontier that's much more challenging than just moving data around. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, moderating a discussion once uh, last year of a bunch of uh, chief medical information officers of big name brand centers in North America, and I asked them what were the impediments to using artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things to, to, to develop better insights. And they say, we're having trouble collecting good data on our patients that are lying in beds in the hospital. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's well, well taken.